Um, my name is Kathy Kluter, and I'm from the Marketing and Communications Department at the Cape Peninsula University of Technology. So without further ado, I'm going to call on our Vice Chancellor, Professor Kristen Schlapu, who will officially welcome you here tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director, Ms. Kathy Kluter. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, at least it's much better. Uh, let me acknowledge the fact that you have actually taken some of my functions of uh, laying the house rules uh, because they brought us on the question of safety. Uh, I think the emergency exit as well, we have actually indicated that, is very important as a section 16.1. I am obliged by law to apply what is called reasonable man's test. Uh, I must pass that particular test with distinction because the safety and security of all our guests, our students, our staff, is on my shoulders. So I have to pass that particular test. Some other people will talk about the really like a man's toots. So that's a test that I'm actually talking about. Um, allow me to talk about the changes before I get into the formal proceedings that um, we are trying very hard as an institution to change the culture, but uh, the culture is not actually easy to change. But what is important is that we know for a fact that you don't change cultures through emails, through WhatsApp and memos. You change it through relationship. That's why we are talking about one smart CPT. And we are talking about one conversation at a time. We are prepared as the new leadership to listen, communicate, and engage. And by so doing, we are believing that we are building the capacity of staff and students while we are fearlessly forging the future of CPT. That's basically what one smart CPUT is all about. It's about a change. And some people are saying, you know, change is very difficult. But let me tell you, any change, it's very, very hard in the beginning. You need a lot of energy. And it's very messy in the middle. But it's fabulous at the end. So we are looking at that particular time when we'll be celebrating the implementation of one smart CPT. We always actually think about the fact that we should not deviate from our mandate, as in our DNA we know that we are in the of technology. It's about mens et manus. It's about mind and hand and the paradigm of relevance to industry. We always look at the ideas that actually give impact, that is now from idea to impact, and the union of knowledge and application. Those are universities of technology, and that's what we are. That's who we are as an institution, and we have to talk about that. So welcome again to our beautiful Belleville campus, and I will lay one day to you the history of the architecture of this institution, which was taken from the Romans. And of course, it was actually executed by Rebel Fox. I will actually share that story at a different pl platform some other time. But it's very, very important that we have to acknowledge those particular aspects. That one of uh, his masterpiece, the late Rebel Fox, was the building of administration of this particular institution. So, you can see his signature around the peninsula about the building that he has actually touched.
program director. Um, with those remarks, let me get into the program and allow me to say happy Women's Month to all our women. Um, and in particular, Professor Beatrice Apiello. <laughs> the Acting Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Marshall Sheldon. The DVC Teaching and Learning, Professor Rishi Balkaran. The Acting Dean of the Faculty of Applied Science, Professor Joseph Kiyoko. All the Dean of other faculties who are here to support, uh, they are welcome. And of course, uh, the respondents, Professor Kimba, our former assistant dean. And you also have now missed my wife, my better half. Uh, she knew Professor Opiolo quite well in the family, and she is also here to help. Uh, welcome, madam. <laughs> Allow me as well to to acknowledge staff and students who are here and some of the co-authors. When I was going through the entire publication list of uh, Professor uh, Opiello, I could pick up some constant names that were coming by. Uh, the name of Professor Adikula, uh, Professor Aroyolo, uh, Dr. Ayanda, who was our postdoc, and of course, Professor Fatoki, who's here, uh, Professor Fatoki. And of course, <laughs> yes, uh, this is the man who started everything. Um, Professor Patrick Indakidemi and Professor Olatunji. Uh, I will be remiss, I've seen at the corner of my eyes, Professor Stark and the wife. Welcome home, Professor Stark. This is always be your home. Um, distinguished guests, uh, by so saying, I'm saying all of us, please be and feel at home. Damesen here, Huyenant. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Molweni Mawetu. Molweni. Ekale. Uh, I thank all of you for accepting our invitation, especially those who come from far away and have traveled many kilometers to be present. I'm so pleased so many professors, friends, and family members have responded. Prof. Piano, this inaugural lecture invokes joy and emotions. Arriving as a postdoc, but distinguishing yourself and attaining NRF C rating. And this is actually recognized nationally and internationally. That means that uh, your peers believe that you enjoy national recognition and of course, some international recognition. So that's what your peers are saying. So indeed, you are a distinguished professor at CPUT. You have been a reviewer of such chairs and you have actually amassed massive grants for the institution. We are really appreciative of that. Our relationship with the University of Florida, I know in Gainesville, it was actually your initiative. Um, she was punching way above her weight, and I remember um, even some of the speakers, I will just actually talk to her. She will say, uh, we'll actually have a professor from the US, a professor from uh, uh, Ghana, a professor from Nigeria, etc. And her role in SATEC as well cannot be under, underscored. And I must also say that I'm uh, thrilled that uh, today we are acknowledging here as an institution. I also look into what is a good age index for a professor in your area compared to professors in other disciplines. Um, what is the age index of a CPT professor? I also ask myself those particular questions. Just check whether we have a smart professor here. And ladies and gentlemen, I can confirm that this is a smart professor. Yeah. 
that we are occurring this evening. I, I look at indices such as the H index, the I index, the G index, and I look at the H index, it's around 12, and I said, last week, we were inaugurating another professor, it was actually around the same. That means that the yardstick that you are using is reliable. And of course, I look at your citation, and it was about 500, and I said, this is indeed, we are going somewhere as an institution. Uh, your impact is unbelievable in terms of at least uh, the number of uh, citations that you are having is very, very impressive. And I'm sure that we'll be able to build a smart institution um, having you at the center of the entire mission. Uh, because we wanted to build a smart university and this smart university can only be built around smart people, around smart education for our students, and around smart research, as well as the smart governance and smart experience. And as an institution, we believe in the Zen tradition, because the Zen tradition speak of beginner's mind. We always, as an institution, believe in that particular Zen tradition. This tradition is simple. It's just saying those who keep their minds open to new concept, they will actually grow. Those whose cup are always empty will always move to higher level of achievement and fulfillment and never be reluctant to ask even the most basic of questions. And smart organizations strengthen themselves ceaselessly. And I think we are going to ceaselessly uh, strengthen ourselves as an institution. In conclusion, program director, um, we have great challenges and great opportunities as a higher education sector. However, all of us together, we can reclaim the higher education sector by supporting events such as the one that we are celebrating here tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, once more, you are welcome to CPUT. Um, it is appropriate for me to say uh, at this juncture, and I think I will be leaving a number of people outside if I don't say thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I will also be leaving a large number of people if I don't actually say Baya Danki Damesen here. And of course, it will be appropriate to say Oshe. <laughs> and as well as Eshe. Odabo. <laughs> Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor, for this lovely words of welcome. And uh, Beatrice, if you can look around, you see you are well loved, eh? Everybody here tonight. <laughs> um, I'm going to call on the um, Acting Dean for the Faculty of Applied Sciences, Professor Joseph Kiyoko, and he will be reading the citation. Thank you. Program Director, uh, the Vice Chancellor, um, the other members of the Executive, distinguished guests. Uh, we say all protocols observed. Um, this is Women's Month, as we know, and it gives me singular pleasure, and I'm honored to read the citation of a woman making strides in science. Well done, Prof. Um, I also feel like mentioning that uh, this year at CPUT, we have, I think it's four citations, four, four professors, 50% are female. So there's something good at CPUT. Uh, 
Uh, Prof. Pelo CV is rich, and I'll try and fit in the time that I've got, so I'll summarize here and there, if I may. And I think the full text will be in the booklet that we all will, will get. Um, Prof. Pelo completed her BSc honors in environmental management and toxicology at the Federal University of Agriculture, Biokuta, in Nigeria, in 1995. She obtained her MSc in Environmental Biology from University of Ibadan, also in Nigeria, in 2001, and her PhD in Environmental Toxicology from FUNAL, that's Federal University of Agriculture, Abiyokuta, in 2007. Um, and Prof started her academic career early in her honors, in a, yeah, quite early, and straight after her honors degree, she was a graduate assistant in 1997 and rose through the ranks to lecturer one <coughs> at FUNAB, where she taught several environmental sciences subjects at both undergraduate and postgrad levels. She then joined CPT as a postdoc in 2010 and has since taught many subjects in chemistry, environmental health, and environmental management. In, 2020, in 2011, she was appointed as a coordinator of the extended curriculum programs in the Faculty of Applied Sciences. Um, just for information, the ECP, this is an initiative supported by uh, DHET, or Department for Education, Science and Technology, there's an S and T there, which is aimed at improving access and success of students in higher education, especially students from underprivileged, underprepared schooling backgrounds. In this portfolio that Prof. Opil has had, she has set the university benchmark for ECP provision. Um, as the Faculty of Applied Sciences hosts ECP programs for 10 different qualifications and more than 30%, one in three, of the enrollment into the Faculty of Applied Sciences is via the ECP initiative. That is way above the university norm. And we're proud. In 2014, Prof. Piolu was promoted to associate, uh, associate professor and in 2018, promoted full professorship. Prof um, is nationally recognized as an established researcher. As mentioned earlier by the VC, she's a C3 rated researcher by the NRF, and her field of specialization is in environmental toxicology and chemistry. <coughs> she focuses her investigations um, on the interactions between humans, like us, and the environment, looking at the, <laughs> lo looking at the chemical contaminations and the health risks, that is toxicology, to humans and ecosystems. <clears throat> she is also interested in the remediation of toxic chemicals in, in the environment. In this area, she has worked on remediation of trace inorganic and organic chemicals in the environment using biogas, uh, biomass. And hopefully we have a bit more of that in, in our talk. For many years, she has worked <clears throat> on several metals at trace levels, and such metals include lead, cadmium, and arsenic. She has also worked on several trace organics, including phenols, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, um, pH, perfluorooctane uh, sulfonates, PFOs, UFO PFOs, uh, perfluorooctanic acid, PFOAs, I hope she, she's going to talk about this in, in English. <laughs> in her talk. As well as veterinary ph uh, pharmaceuticals. Now, many of these chemicals that have got these long names are classified as endocrine disrupting chemicals, and they are therefore capable of impairing human health and the health of the ecosystem. In working the with the community of researchers, Prof. Opiolu has served as the chair, co-chair, member of the organizing committees, and a session chair of several meetings of the Society of Environmental Chemistry and Toxicology of CITAC in Europe, CITAC North America, CITAC Africa, and CITAC World Conferences. And this indicates an international recognition of her expertise in the field of environmental sciences. She is currently the Vice President of CITAC Africa, and drum roll, <laughs> President-elect 
from 2020. So that's the president of CETAC Africa from next year. Well done, Prof. And she's a guest member of the CETAC World Council. But Prof. Apiolo is also a teacher, not just a researcher. Um, a teacher who's engaged with the community around her. Apart from teaching at CPUT, she was a co-developer of an international program um, of the CITAC online short course aimed at developing countries. And she is well sought after as an evaluator of academic programs for, um, by both the South African Council on Higher Education, CHE, and also by the Namibian Council on Higher Education. And this is a rare feat for scientists in our field. Thus, in this era of new programs, and new program development at CPUT, Prof. Opiolu is an asset to this university. In terms of community engagement, uh, Prof. Opiolu has an exciting community engagement project with the people of Rosenville, um, that's towards Hermanus, and she is working with a Canadian team, Days for Girls. Maybe we'll hear more about that when she, when she talks. And, and for research partnerships, Prof. Piolu has strong research networks uh, that some of has mentioned with collaborators from the USA, University of Florida, and Baylor University, Waco, Texas in the US, uh, Technische University at Dresden in, the, in Germany, Deutschland, and Lund University in Sweden, and many other universities across the globe. Prof. Piolu has served as a reviewer for several national and international journals and for grant applications for bodies such as the NRF and the Water Research Commission. In terms of research output, Prof. Opiolu has 53 peer-reviewed journal publications, nine conference proceedings, four technical reports, 37 peer-reviewed conference presentations to her credit. <laughs> that is admirable. She has supervised to completion as the main supervisor, one doctoral student and seven master's students. Currently, she is also serving as a major supervisor to one doctoral student whose thesis has been examined and two master's students. In addition to these, she also co-supervises two other doctoral students and, is a, and a postdoctoral fellow at CPUT. Currently in this university at CPUT, she is the leader of the research focus area on climate change and environment. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Professor Beatrice Opiolo. Thank you. <laughs> Program director, please indulge me to share my little story. was motivated by my extended family setting and the struggles of my parents. I realized that those whose parents were more educated were the most comfortable in our family. I also grew up seeing people acquire tertiary education and immediately had a good life. So I understood at an early age that education is the key out of poverty. I've always loved being in school, so studying was not a problem. The greatest challenge for me was lack of the resources to achieve my goals. My troubled teenage years disrupted and almost destroyed my vision for my today and future. For some reason, I always knew that this day would come if I persisted. I was determined to make a statement that with God, all things are possible. 
it doesn't matter how vulnerable one may be biologically, geographically, economically, or socially. Gender, race, religion, mistakes and obstacles are all opportunities to discover oneself and live a fulfilling life of purpose. My calling is to seek knowledge and to teach others in different ways. These I pursue with passion and all of my strength. I am African and proudly so. Thank you Nigeria for raising me for my world and thank you South Africa for giving me a home and a space to follow my passion. I am a woman born and raised to live for a purpose. In my journey, I've been bruised, hurt, neglected and rejected. I've experienced abuse, betrayals and disappointments. I've fallen, picked up death along the way and broken many times. My scars are my strength and my mistakes, my lessons and my pride. I am a product of grace, love, humanity and diversity. These are the drivers of my pursuits in life. My name is Beatrice. You are doing on my own. I'm not tired. I'm not Mr. Vice Chancellor, Professor Nissen Slapo, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Research, Technology, Innovation and Partnerships, Professor Marshall Sheldon, Deputy Vice Chancellor, Teaching and Learning, Professor Rishi Balkaran, Acting Registrar, Ms. Guselwa Marala, Dean, Faculty of Applied Sciences, Professor Joseph Kiyoko, former DVC Teaching and Learning, Professor Anthony Stark and wife, former Dean, Faculty of Applied Sciences, Professor Lale Konfatoki, former Assistant Dean, Faculty of Applied Sciences and my respondent, Professor Bekumusa Jabulani Klimba, <laughs> National Chairperson, Commission for Gender Equality, Ms. Tamara Matebula, Provincial Manager, Commission for Gender Equality, Ms. Itolile Mtobo, Directors of Institutional Units here present, Professor Rene Pelicia. Ms. Nonko Sitowana, another director there present, fellow research focus area leaders, research chairs, management staff or faculty of applied sciences, all academic and support staff of, staff of CPUT, distinguished guests, students, friends, family, live stream viewers, Facebook audience, media crew, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Program director, it is with a grateful heart that I'm on this podium today to share with you my journey into full professorship. In the next hour or so, I will share with you my tainted potpourri pot story based on my knowledge and research findings. Inorganic and emerging toxicants that I have studied in different environmental samples, my ongoing and future research, contribution to teaching and learning nationally, regionally, and globally, as well as some of my community engagement activities. 
Mr. Vice Chancellor. Potpourri is produced from dry plants. Oh, sorry. Potpourri is produced from dry plant materials to generate natural scents in homes. However, essential oils may be added to the bowl for a more lasting fragrance. The quest for a cheaper alternative may also allow the use of synthesized chemical analogs of the fragrances. In this analogy, potpourri figuratively represents the world's environment with all of its beautiful resources. This potpourri symbolizes the vast and beautiful natural resources which the world is endowed. These include the air, oceans, lakes, rivers, forests, mineral resources, plants, and animals. Land, water, and air, as we know, are all linked by many natural cycles. This means that a negative influence on one may have direct or indirect effects on others. In an ongoing quest to improve human well-being, inventions have resulted in longer life expectancies, wealth creation, industrialization, and urbanization. However, anthropogenic activities necessary for human existence Dignity and quality of life unfortunately come with detrimental consequences to people and the environment. Sustainable utilization and management of natural resources is therefore imperative. And it is the responsibility of everyone that lives on the earth. My journey into environmental sciences started in 1990 when I applied to study chemistry as a direct entry student with a diploma qualification. My application was declined, but I was offered admission into a new program, environmental toxicology, management and toxicology. I was clueless about environmental sciences, but I enjoyed most of my subjects. In the third year of my five year honors degree program, I experienced my first research into the environment. I wrote a term paper that later became a staple for hazardous substances management students, titled, Technology is a, is a Blessing as Well as a Curse. <laughs> this task opened my understanding to the different issues associated with discoveries and inventions and their effects on the environment. Later during my training, Field excursions to the Omo Forest Reserve, Nigeria, the so-called landfill site in Lagos, and my industrial work experience at the Ogun State Environmental Task Force then provided me with insights into the numerous environmental issues. The knowledge of these possible life scenarios widened and guided my research in pollutant identification, measurements, assessment of harmful effects, and pollution management. I had investigated air quality issues, soil pollution effects, food contamination, and water pollution for most of my research career. Environmental toxicology and chemistry formed the basis of my research expertise. My research objective is to understand occurrence of pollutants in environmental matrices, their impacts on human health, and the health of ecosystems. Method development, monitoring, remediation, and risk assessment studies of these pollutants are the core of my research focus, particularly on endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, many of which are compounds of emerging concern. Thus, my research mission is not just to establish levels of pollutants in the environment, but also to assess possible risks and develop abatement methods that will be cheap and available in developing economies like South Africa, providing a comprehensive approach to solving environmental problems. Vice Chancellor, sir, there are approximately 140 million chemicals in different parts of the world. And in the US alone, about 80 million are currently in use. I don't have the data for African countries. 
Most of these compounds can be found in several applications and processes. Production systems, industries, medicine and academia are some of the sectors that have and continue to benefit from the use of chemicals. Unfortunately, they have the potential to get into environmental compartments where they become dangerous to humans and the environment. Identification and quantification of exposure and effects are often critical to chemical use, pollution control, health and safety, as well as natural resources management. This is because environmental contaminants often occur at trace and ultra trace levels. However, these small amounts are significantly important to man and ecosystems as they may exert deleterious effects. Climate change will further aggravate the negative effects of environmental contaminants on man and environment. My field of study, environmental toxicology and chemistry, addresses most of these challenges. As an academic, Mr. Vice-Chancellor, my approach is anchored on the tripodal principle of research, teaching, and community engagement. I believe that my research should inform the curriculum, my teaching, as well as my community engagement activities. Vice Chancellor, since early 2000s, I understood the need for my research to be aligned to national and global imperatives. And so when I started my career, the early part of my career was the Millennial Development Goals. And one of the goals was to make, to ensure environmental sustainability. And nations and organizations were made to be committed, to commit to the achievement of the, this goal. Out of the, uh, there were eight goals and they were supposed to be committed to the eight, one of the eight goals. One of these was to integrate principles of sustainable development into country policies and programs. In 2015, the United Nations agreed on 17 global goals aimed at transforming our world by 2030. My research is directly linked to goal six. I try to put stars on those goals. And the, the, the goal six is the one that my research is directly linked to, clean water and sanitation. Others that my research may positively affect include goals Go to zero hunger, very sustainable food production through agricultural practices and water use. And go to, go see, uh, go, others that my research possibly have go to, and go three, health and well being, go nine, innovation, goals 11 and 12, sustainability. Goal 13, climate action and drought mitigation, and goal 14, life below water. My research is also linked to the South African National Development Strategy and the South African Water Resource Management Strategy, since access to water is one of the key development programs of government. The burning issues of water loss, drought, and water pollution in a climate changing world <laughs> drew my attention to investigating possible water pollution abatement strategies. Imagine contaminants, many of which are endocrine disruptors, are of particular interest to me. These compounds include heavy metals, phenolic compounds, polycyclic aromatic, aromatic hydrocarbons, perfluorinated compounds, pharmaceutical residues, and nanomaterials. Mr. Vice Chancellor, since this evening is about me telling the story of my journey to full professorship, I will quickly go through my early research attempts. My first attempt at scientific research was my honors project titled Lead as a Pollution Index in Soils of Abeokuta City. I discovered then that people living and or working near highways were more predisposed to lead poisoning from vehicular emissions. Lead concentrations in soil nearer highways were higher than from other sites. The levels obtained were also positively correlated to vehicular density. This stimulated my interest in learning more about lead poisoning. Toxic effects of lead in children and adults is widely reported, 
and lead has also been identified as an endocrine disruptor. In 1999, I investigated the possible effects of lead on crops planted on lead contaminated soil for my MSc degree. The study revealed the yield and nutrient quality of two cowpea varieties planted on polluted soil were reduced, but lead was not found at detectable levels in the seeds. However, the metal was found in the roots and stems of the plants. Similar work with other heavy metals and different crops were carried out in subsequent years, and some of them were reported. The results indicated that atmospheric deposition and other exposure rules, such as contaminated water, might have negative consequences on plants, thereby accumulation, which may later impact on humans. Over the years, I studied indoor air pollution, occupational exposure to pollutants, and effluent toxicity to plants, animals, and people, as well as gender dimensions to environmental hazards. All of my findings confirmed that our air environment is polluted by different kinds of pollutants. For example, we discovered that some fish processors in Abekuta City, Nigeria, mostly women, were exposed to noxious gases such as carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, and methane. Our, our study on implications of Adire a local textile production on the environment and human health revealed toxic effluent discharges into the environment. We established that individuals who experienced exposure in the industry developed health issues, including skin rashes, ulceration, swelling, and respiratory diseases. We also investigated environmental and human exposure to pollutants from activities such as cassava processing. More recently, Mr. Vice Chancellor, we investigated the ambient air concentrations of some gaseous pollutants in the vicinity of a chemical and fertilizer production company in Zimbabwe. The cloud concentrations of ammonia, sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide in the company were higher than observed distances away from the facility. Variable concentrations measured of measured gases Cageous pollutants within the plant seem to be due to hot spots such as the ammonia loop, valve leakage areas, and the prevailing meteorological conditions at the time of measurement. Sources of air and soil pollution therefore include domestic, artisanal, and industrial activities. Most of the pollutants measured pose significant risks to humans and the environment. My studies confirm that, unfortunately, my two perfect potpourries, air and soil, have been tainted by many poisons. We also did some food contamination studies. In 2004, I was the environmental scientist on the project Rural Urban Migration Poverty and Sustainable Development, Comparative Study of Lagos and Three Southwestern States of Nigeria. We monitored effects of migration, population density, standards of living, and the quality of water and street foods in Lagos and migrant states of origin. Street foods and water samples analyzed were highly tainted with chemical and biological pollutants. Roasted plantain and maize the two most popular street foods in Lagos, and drinking water samples were collected, first from Lagos and then from migrant places of origin, Ogun, Oshun, and Oyo states. Water and food contaminants were found at unacceptable levels, including the heavy metal, lead, and microorganisms. All water samples collected, save two, were fecally contaminated. We concluded that industrial activities, vehicular emissions, disposed by products of technology, amongst others, which are absent at migrants' places of orientation, contributed to higher chemical loads in Lagos. On the other hand, microbial pollution was more pronounced in states of origin due to poor and inadequate drinking water supplies relative to Lagos. Microbial contamination is indicative of inadequate hygiene 
and lack of proper sanitation infrastructure. We opined that education and awareness about hygienic food processing practices and proper packaging of street vended foods should be promoted to reduce the environmental contaminant load of the products. In 2010, Mr. Vice Chancellor, I pioneered the study of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and endocrine destructor at the CPUT. At CPUT. My interest was to study the relationship between levels of PAHs in and food processing methods, which has not been studied extensively in South Africa. I received a university research funding grant to investigate the implications of processing methods on the amount of PAHs in meat and meat products. We studied the effects We studied the effect of meat processing, that is cooking methods, on the pHs levels of meat products. We discovered that boiled or steamed meat and meat products had the least pH burden compared to fried and grilled products. Bad news for those of us that love the fried meat. <laughs> The study resulted in published articles on PAH's occurrence in food products in high-impact accredited journals. Vice Chancellor, sir. Global population continues to rise at exponential rates, especially in the poorer countries of the world, resulting in greater demand for food shelter, goods, and services. These in turn lead to more pressure being exerted on the Earth's natural resources, such as land, water, and minerals. Agricultural and manufacturing sectors need several inputs that range from land to agrochemicals, high-yielding and disease-resistant crops, animals to toxic industrial chemicals, extracted natural resources, water, and much more. All these activities generate wealth and lead to improved quality of life, but with negative effects on humans and ecological systems. Climate change continues to reduce available water resources. Drought, extreme events such as wildfires and cyclones, pollution, increasing population and conflicts are some of the key drivers of water availability in terms of quality, quantity and affordability. During drought, concentrations of water contaminants increase due to smaller volumes. We know that chemicals in the environment are often more toxic at higher temperatures. The volatile compounds contaminate the air with consequent hazards to exposed individuals. The increased temperatures favor the avail availability of poisons to humans and other environmental compartments. The drought experienced in the Western and Eastern Cape provinces, South Africa, in 2017-2018, brought the impacts of climate change closer home. Both provinces came close to a day zero scenario, when all taps will be dry and people will have to queue for water at designated points. Water scarcity is a major concern for citizens and governments because decline in water quantity and quality will expose communities to risks associated with limited supply or total lack of water for human activities. Ecological systems are also being disrupted due to climate change effects. Cyclone Idai recently brought the reality of climate change nearer to Africa. Four Southern African countries, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Malawi, and Madagascar were affected by the storm. Thousands were displaced, thousands were hospitalized, and hundreds of people lost their lives. For almost three decades now, I've been learning about different local and global environmental issues. In the early 90s, many scientists were not convinced about the reality of climate change due to lack of substantive data. Conspiracy and economic theories about climate change issues were very dominant then. There were different schools of thought about the reliability of the then available data. We now have vast amounts of information on climate change. And all of the pre predictions made three decades ago are now manifested. A few days ago, Mr. Vice Chancellor, Thompson Reuters Foundation published an article 
that described water pollution as an invisible threat to global goals. Unfortunately, it is absolutely true. Mr. Vice Chancellor, since most of the chemicals that are investigated, most of them are endocrine disruptors. I think it will be appropriate for me to briefly talk about endocrine disruptors. Endocrine disrupting chemicals, popularly known as EDCs, they are substances that alter the function of the endocrine system. They are very significant at ultra stress levels due to their potential for causing adverse effects on the biotic components of the ecosystem. They include estrogenic and androgenic chemicals that bind to estrogen and androgen receptors, interfering with the action of endogenous steroid hormones. The modes of action of these chemicals through the endocrine system typically lead to toxicity in specific endocrine target organisms, organs. Some of these chemicals are used as pesticides and they remain as residues in fresh and processed food we eat. Other common sources of exposure that contribute to our to total toxic load include drinking water, lung chemicals, consumer products, household insecticide use, and plasticizers. Domestic and industrial wastewater are significant sources of EDCs to receiving water bodies, as well as uncontrolled domestic and industrial discharge of waterways in developing countries. Surface runoff from cities, roads, and waste landfills also contribute to these chemicals in aquatic environment. High concentrations of EDCs may also be found in drinking waters. The effect of EDCs on human body differ substantially from chronic to acute exposures. My work is focused on EDCs, heavy metals, phenols, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, perfluorinated compounds, and pharmaceuticals. In the last decade, my research has contributed to the existing body of knowledge on EDCs data. I worked on the development of the new methods for the analysis, monitoring, remediation, risk assessment studies of EDCs, agricultural crop residues, activated charcoals, and indigenous microbes have been studied as adsorbents for pollutants removal from water, and nanomaterials are now being investigated for remediation abilities. This slide just shows how what EDCs can do to organisms that are exposed. The, the fish here was naturally a male fish, but where after exposure to an endocrine disruptor, what is called feminization occurred, and if it, become, it physically literally becomes a female that lays egg. And this is a possibility in human beings also. So we must be careful what we get exposed to at, that, at any point in time. That is the point I'm trying to make. That when we, are, we get exposed to some of these chemicals, things can, chemical things, in, uh, interactions happen within the body, the physiological system that can trigger certain reactions that can result in things like this. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, the theme of my doctoral research was water remediation, using locally available materials. It was clear to me that industrial and agricultural pollution are threats to water resources. With the guidance of my supervisors, I decided to explore potential solutions to the water pollution crisis. Like my previous studies on air and soil, I started with lead-contaminated waters. I studied the possibility of using crop residues to remove lead from industrial effluents. We discovered that three of the six adsorbents used had about 100% removal efficiency for lead from battery and paint effluents. We concluded that yam peel, cassava peel, cowpea husks had great potentials to remove lead from industrial effluents. They were more efficient than the more expensive commercially available adsorbent, DOEX 
processing and procedural costs showed that DOEX was at least 170 times more expensive than the biosubments that we used. Disruption studies suggested environmental friendliness of the adsorbent, since metals so removed could be recovered for reuse and the biosubments were biodegradable. On completion of my study, the International Foundation for Science, IFS Sweden, provided a grant of $10,500 for me to continue the study with four other metals. The results were similar to those obtained for lead remediation. Over 90% of cadmium, chromium, copper, lead, and zinc were removed from paint and textile effluents using sugar cane biomass. And then I arrived at CPUT in 2008, and my first research was phenols in water. Phenols are general purpose chemicals widely used in production processes. Phenols are present in domestic and industrial wastewaters, natural waters, and potable water supplies, and therefore they are a major concern. Phenolic compounds may alter taste and odor of potable water even at nanogram per liter level. Disinfecting water using chlorination has been suspected as being responsible for chlorophenol formation as a disinfection byproduct in water. Phenols occur in the food chain and are toxic and they have harmful effects on humans. They are endocrine disruptors and have been labeled as potential carcinogens. At CPUT, I developed a high-performance liquid chromatographic ultraviolet detection method for the simultaneous determination of 11 US EPA priority phenolic pollutants in water. The study contributed significantly to the measurement of phenols in environmental samples in South Africa. The method was validated and used to identify and quantify the phenolic compounds in bottled, tap, and river water samples, as well as a wastewater treatment plant effluent. Two compounds, two chlorophenol and two four dichlorophenol were detected in some drinking water samples analyzed. So if I'm hesitant to drink my water from a plastic bottle, now you know why. Four of the analytes were also detected in surface water samples with the concentration of 4,6-dinitro-O-crystal being the highest in all the samples analyzed. Levels of phenolic compounds in the deep and coarse river, Cape, rivers Cape Town were also reported in the study. The report paved way for other studies within the research group. Later in 2014, we investigated the possibility of producing activated carbons from grape leaf litter for the removal of phenolic compounds from wastewater. The leaf litter yielded good activated carbons and was effective in remediation of phenol, 2-nitrophenol, 4-nitrophenol, and 4-chlorophenol from contaminated water. And then I moved to pHs in water. I assessed the levels of 16 US EPA priority pHs in two important freshwater system in, systems in the Western Cape Province, South Africa, the Deep and Plankenberg rivers. The potential of activated carbons produced from grape leaf litter and indigenous microorganisms in the Deep River for PAH's mineralization was also investigated. Grape leaf litter showed enormous prospects as precursor of activated carbon. The yield of grape leaf litter as precursor of activated carbon ranged from 44% to 58%, and with excellent surface properties necessary for pollutants removal efficiency. The estimated absorption capacities of the zinc chloride and phosphoric acid activated carbons for phenantrine removal from aqueous solutions were 94 and, and 89 milligram per gram, respectively. An indigenous microorganism isolated from a site on the deep river was also used for the mineralization of PAHs. The microorganism's percentage removal efficiencies ranged between 65 and 81. We concluded 
that the PAH degrading microorganisms isolated during the study can be used on a larger commercial scale to bioremediate PAH's contaminated water systems. Mr. Vice Chancellor and the Dean of Applied Sciences, now I'm onto the perfluorinated compounds, and I'm going to pronounce them in English. <laughs> perfluorinated compounds are synthetic chemical co substances that are widely used in many applications due to their valuable properties like thermal stability and resistance to degradations. And we all have perfluorinated compounds in possibly most of our jackets, the leather jackets, and most of the water resistant ways that we wear, we probably have them there. They are used in the production of aqueous film, fo film forming foams for fire fighting activities, hydraulic elevation foils, chrome plating, and the photography industry. They are also widely used as components of polymers in food packaging, the non stick cookware that we use in our kitchens, surface active agents in waterproof clothing and stain resistant carpeting, among others. They enter the environment from the processes leading to the production of PFCs and der derivatives con containing these materials. We undertook a monitoring campaign to assess the strengths of nine PFCs in surface water and sediment from the Plakenberg and Deep Rivers, Cape Town. A method was developed and validated for routine determination of nine PFCs. We also studied the removal of perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, and perfluorooctane sulfonate, PFOS, from aqueous solutions using activated carbons produced from the biomass of grape leaf litter. The partitioning and availability potential of the compounds were also investigated. Results from our field survey were subjected to probabilistic risk assessment models. Seasonal trends of PFCs in river systems showed that compounds occurred most frequently in the summer months. Sample locations near farming communities and recreational areas upstream of both rivers had lower levels of the compounds. Sampling points closer to informal settlements and industrial areas had very high levels of PFCs. These elevated levels suggested that activities from industries and the poor waste management systems associated with informal settlements contributed to PFC's pollution of the water bodies. Perfluoroalkylcarboxylic acid compounds were the most frequently detected compounds among the PFCs investigated in both surface water and sediment samples. The priority compounds, PFOA and PFOS, were also detected alongside other compounds at elevated levels in both rivers. The study revealed that long-chain PFCs were more prevalent in sediment samples than shorter-chain fluorinated compounds, presumably due to their higher molecular weight. The higher concentrations of PFCs measured in the sediment compartment suggest that sediment is a potential sink for PFCs in river systems. I'm still talking about emerging contaminants and now pharmaceutical compounds in water. Pharmaceutical compounds are increasingly being used in promoting human health and preventing diseases over the past decades. These compounds have properties such as polarity, polymorphism, complex chemical structures, ability to be ionized, and having multiple ionization sites spread throughout the molecule. These characteristics help them to stay longer in different environmental matrices due to slow breakdown that may lead to persistence, accumulation, and or redistribution in the environment. Several workers have reported on the potential aquatic toxicity, antibiotic resistance, genotoxicity, and endocrine disruption and have raised awareness of these compounds. Pharmaceutical residues are now considered as emerging environmental contaminants. The major source of these compounds is via sewage systems of pharmaceutical manufacturing plants, livestock production farms, pet and animal care, hospitals, as well as private households entering the sewer network and reaching the wastewater treatment plants and landfills. 
Other sources of contamination in developing countries include direct discharge of untreated wastewaters into the environment via leaking septic tanks, landfill leaches, treatment drugs directly disposed of, and application of sewage sludge as fertilizers in agricultural fields. We developed a method for the detection and quantification of three antibiotics, amoxicillin, ampicillin, and chloramphenicol in surface water samples of the Deep River, Cape Town, South Africa. We also produced, characterized, and explored the effectiveness of activated carbons produced from grape slurry for antibiotics abatement from aqueous solutions. The beta-lactam antibiotics were detected at variable concentrations in the Deep River. Subsection studies show that the modified grape slurry biomass waste effectively removed bitter lac palms from simulated wastewater. In another study, Mr. Vice Chancellor, a high performance liquid chromatographic coupled to ultraviolet detector method was optimized and validated for the separation and detection of selected pharmaceuticals identified from a screening exercise. We also developed and validated a multi-residue solid phase extraction procedure for the recovery of 10 pharmaceutical compounds from agricultural wastewater. Water samples were collected from different types of water bodies, streams, ponds, and drainages in the vicinity of some livestock farms. Eight pharmaceutical residues were detected in most of the sampling stations, although occurrence varied at different sampling stations over the study period. Health risk assessment studies suggested that exposure to samples with the highest concentration of 17 beta estradiol posed some risk of developing cancer through accidental ingestion via recreational activities. We observed mutagenic activity in samples from sheep and poultry farms with mutation ratios ranging from six times to close to eight times the natural background mutation rate. Also, osteogenicity was detected in effluents from pig and sheep farms. Poultry and cattle farm effluents exhibited high acute toxicities to exposed model organisms. And I will quickly talk about nanomaterials. The use of nanomaterials and nanotechnology for water and wastewater treatment is becoming increase increasingly popular. Nanocatalysts have exceptionally large surface areas, active size, and short diffusion length, resulting in high absorption capacity and fast kinetics. These properties make them effective for the removal of recalcitrant contaminants. Zeolites prepared from coal, flash, coal fly ash, metal oxides, and magnesium-based metal hydrotalcides were screened for absorptive removal of ciprofloxacin from aqueous solutions. The result indicated that chemical absorption occurred during the degradation process. This was consistent with the observations on the SEM images taken, chemical oxygen demand, and structural changes results obtained in the study. Toxicological results showed that the treated ciprofloxacin solution with zeolite metal oxide was less toxic to the microalgae micro exposed relative to the untreated solution. We demonstrated the effective, effectiveness of zeolite for the treatment of ciprofloxacin in an aqueous solution. In an ongoing study, novel beta ion oxyhydroxide nanoparticles polymeric composites have been developed for wastewater remediation. The synthesized nanomaterials have been characterized and then used singly and in combination with ozonation for the degradation of phenolic and pharmaceutical compounds in simulated and real wastewater. Ecotoxicological studies have been conducted to determine possible risks associated with the use of the synthesized polymetric, polymeric nanocomposite. Leaching and reuse potentials of the synthesized composites will also be investigated. We hope that one output from this study will be to provide solutions to the ineffective removal of emerging contaminants by conventional water treatment processes. Ecological risk assessment and human health risk assessment. My research initiatives have established the occurrence of contaminants in food, water, and soils. 
The issue that remains is how harmful the poison is, since every compound is a potential poison given the right dosage. This is the rationale for setting up a laboratory for toxicity testing at CPUT. We now have a laboratory for investigating possible human and ecological health effects of contaminants in a different environmental matrices at their levels of occurrence. For example, human and ecological health risk assessment of veterinary pharmaceuticals in wastewaters from livestock farms were carried out. The investigated compounds exhibited mutagenic and estrogenic potentials and exerted toxicity on aquatic organisms. Four students, Mr. Vice Chancellor, are currently being trained on ecological risk assessment technologies in the laboratory. My ongoing and future research plans. My studies will continue to focus on method development, monitoring, remediation, and risk assessment studies of endocrine disrupting chemicals in environmental matrices, particularly water systems. My group will continue to establish levels of pollutants in the environment, assess possible human health and ecological risks, and develop abatement methods that are cheap and easily available in developing economies like South Africa. The core of my research will now be more on toxicological studies of EDCs, nanomaterials, microplastics, as well as whole effluent toxicity testing. The long-term objective of these studies is to develop a relatively cheap and environmentally friendly technology that will remove a range of pollutants simultaneously from water systems. It is envisioned that in the near future, levels of the studied pollutants will be established and technologies developed to reduce their occurrence in ecological systems. The occurrence of plastics in the environment is a global concern. About 50% of all plastic products manufactured globally are estimated to be disposable. More than half of the world's ocean litter has been reported to be plastic fragments. These occur as macroplastics, mesoplastics, and microplastics in the aquatic environment based on their particle sizes. They get into rivers through wind, storm sewers, and wastewater treatment plants. They have been identified as EDCs and may also cause choking, internal or external wounds, ulceration, blocked digestive tracts, false sense of satiation, debilitation, and death to marine organisms. Globally, their presence in the environment is currently a priority research area in environmental sciences due to the associated negative impacts on man and the environment. Studies on microplastic pollution is scanty in South Africa, hence my interest. Increasing water scarcity necessitates investigation into risk factors that may negatively affect our water resources. I therefore plan to assess levels of various categories of plastics in different environmental matrices. Risk assessment of macroplastics will be investigated using different bioassays to estimate potential effects of microplastics on exposed biota. When I, my citation was being read, my dean introduced me as the Extended Curriculum Programs Coordinator for the Applied Sciences Faculty, uh, but I, unfortunately I won't talk about my Extended cur cur Curriculum Programs Coordination because that is given and I think the work speaks for itself in the faculty and in the institution, but I will try to talk about my research, the interface between my research, my teaching, and community engagement activities briefly. Vice Chancellor, my initial experience, first as a peer tutor, and later as a teaching assistant, ignited my passion for teaching. I realized that students understand concepts more easily when they are related to routine, everyday activities and phenomena. Environmental science is a multidisciplinary field that necessitates practitioners' holistic understanding of the environment. I therefore always link different parts of a particular subject to its relevance to man and environment. My teaching approach has always been learner-centered while emphasizing knowledge and activities relevant in industry. 
apart from traditional PowerPoint presentations, simulation of scenarios and problem-based learning activities are at the core of my teaching practices. I use reflection sessions to facilitate knowledge, knowledge creation and learning, rather than providing knowledge at all times. Some of my findings in the laboratory and the field studies, as well as emerging issues, are always incorporated into the subjects that I teach. And some of my students that are here, they will attest to that. Nationally, Vice Chancellor, I'm a regular evaluator of academic programs for the Council on Higher Education. I had reviewed several academic programs submitted for approval to CHE at the National Diploma, Bachelor's, Master's, and Doctoral levels. I served as the chair of an accreditation, accreditation team for the Namibia Council on Higher Education with a commendation letter for an excellent service from the Namibia Council on Higher Education. On a global scale, I co-developed an international online short course facilitated by the Society of Environmental Toxicology and Chemistry in 2015. The course was aimed at developing countries. The objective of the course is to empower environmental practitioners with skills and tools for ecological risk assessment. More recently, in May 2019, I was one of the two Africans that co-facilitated a risk assessment course in Cape Town. The course was developed by the CITAC World Council Education Committee in collaboration with the Society for Risk Analysis. I am also actively involved in CITAC regional, global, and global governance structures. Recently, I was one of the African facilitators that taught on aquatic monitoring at the German South Africa Summer School in Bluefontein, UFS, funded by Volkswagen Germany. Over 40 professionals, postgraduate and postdoctoral students, government and industry practitioners from South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, Swaziland, Tanzania, and Zambia attended the Summer School. And Vice Chancellor Sir, I'm proud to tell you that I went with, with two of my master's students and they were funded. I sourced the funds to, for them to participate in that summer school. I taught a chemical monitoring model with my German colleague, Dr. Hilma Bonick. At CPUT last year, I organized the Beat Plastic Pollution Campaign. My knowledge of the interrelationships between all environmental compartments motivated me to lead that campaign. The themes of both the World Environment Day and the World Oceans Day were centered on plastic pollution. I organized a series of events, symposium, cleaning exercise, radio interviews for staff, and a public lecture to create awareness in different ways. Various stakeholders were involved during and after the week which resulted in positive changes in consumption preferences at CPUT. And I think I gained a disciple in beat plastic campaign in Professor Rene Pelicia. We no longer use single-use plastics in our meetings. I'm also involved in several other community engagement activities linked to human health and sanitation. Chancellor, I'm an ambassador of Women's Health Days for Girls program. The Dean tried to introduce it, and that is just the summary of that project. 
This for Guys program is based in Canada. The organization employs volunteers to manufacture sanitary pads for girls and women in poor communities. Evidence suggests that millions of girls lose school days due to not having adequate access to sanitary pads. Similarly, older women are also exposed to various diseases due to lack of sanitation, thereby reducing their potential for productivity. My responsibilities include teaching girls and women from poor communities about reproductive health, personal hygiene, and distribution of free, reusable sanitary pads. I chose the farming community of Rossonville, Western Cape, for the project. I distributed over 200 kits to school girls and women in 2017-2018. The long-term plan is to establish local groups in communities that can produce the materials and generate funds from it. DFG Canada is willing to assist with training if I can source infrastructural support locally. I intend to achieve this in the near future. The project supports girls and women to remain productive during their menstrual periods by providing access to sanitary pads. The project also enhances sustainability globally through reduction of waste dumped in landfills for proper disposal of single-use conventional sanitary pads. My concluding remarks. We are almost there. <laughs> the Earth is the only planet known to be habitable for all living things. Every human being also has one set of organs, and so we need to keep them well. The world has relatively pure, the world was relatively pure and free of poisons. It was a perfect potpourri with sweet natural fragrance. Human activities over centuries have tainted our being and the potpourri, the earth's natural resources. Poisons in the environment are dangerous to people and ecological systems. Climate change effects will further compound the harm that these poisons may cause to living things. For over two decades, I've been consistently learning, teaching, and studying pollutants in the environment. I strive at all times to grow with emerging techniques and environmental issues that require research and capacity development. Since I started my career as an academic in 1997, I have contributed to the existing body of knowledge on inorganic and organic environmental pollutants, mostly EDCs. My research has provided other researchers with analytical methods that may be used to identify and quantify several environmental pollutants. I've also provided data on the environmental occurrence of EDCs and possible risks associated with some of the compounds. I've been able to explore the use of more readily available cheaper and environmentally friendly alternatives for water and wastewater remediation. Today marks the beginning of a revolution for sustainable development. My goal is to continually and consistently transfer the body of knowledge acquired to date to the next generation. At the core of this will be humanity, issues of inequality, and environmental advocacy. The damage to our tainted potpourri can still be slowed down and some effects reversed, even in a climate changing world. Capacity development through formal and informal education, service provision by governments, lifestyle and mindset changes are some of the things that societies may strategically target to protect, protect the environment in perpetuity. Mr. Vice Chancellor, Please permit me to sing the praise of my heroes and my heroines. I'm grateful to God Almighty for all of his faithfulness to me since conception until now and on to eternity. My appreciation goes to the CPUT Council, the Vice Chancellor, the Deputy Vice Chancellors, and executive management for their support at all times, both past and present. Thank you very much for all the support.
and these heroes. I acknowledge the support of the Faculty of Applied Sciences Management under the leadership of Professor Joseph Kiyoko. A big thanks to my retired colleagues and supervisors, Professor Lale Konfatoki, Professor Victor Higo, he's unfortunately not able to come today, but he really want, wanted to be here but for some reasons. And pro, but I trust he's watching now. And Professor Bekumusa Jabulani Klimba. <laughs> the trial showed me the ropes and supported me when I first joined CPUT. I also thank all my colleagues, academic, technical and administrative staff in the Faculty of Applied Sciences. Thank you for your support all these years. To my institutional extended curriculum programs colleagues, led by Professor James Garraway, also not here, and Professor Anthony Stark, thank you so much. They are both retired now, but thank you for all you did for me. I'm grateful to you all for providing me with a safety net because I didn't have a department. I was a faculty staff and I belonged to the ECP community. Thank you for providing me with that safety net and home over the past eight years. My sincere appreciation goes to my fellow research focus area leaders under the leadership of Professor René Pellissier. I cannot but thank my colleagues at the research unit, Center for Postgraduate Studies, Marketing Unit, Creditors and Procurement, Library Unit, Fundani, Student Counseling, Student Development for their support and collaboration. A very big thank you to all the students I taught and supervised. You motivate me to do more. I am who I am today because of you. And ladies and gentlemen, I want you to please help me to recognize one special person, one of my products. I supervised this undergraduate project and he saw this invitation on Facebook page, and he contacted me to say, Ma'am, I must be there. He flew from Abuja just to be in this room for, with me. <laughs> Thank you, Simon. I am who I am because of you. Thank you very much. I also appreciate all my research collaborators and networks at CPUT and elsewhere. I would not have been able to do most of the things that I did without my funding agencies. And so I want to thank the South African National Research Foundation, the Water Research Commission, Israeli Mashav, the Dutch Netherlands Fellowship Programs, French Secret Pripoge, and the Swedish International Foundation for Science. Thank you for your support. And to my CTAC family, I acknowledge, I know you are all watching now, I acknowledge the support and contribution of CTAC to my professional development and international visibility. My CTAC family provided me with enormous opportunities to be mentored by the best in my field and also to be a mentor to scores of others. I'm especially grateful to Lorraine Maltby, Larry Kapuska, Brian Brooks, Bart Buffett, Charlie Mency, Goethe Arts, and Susan Christopherson. And to the ones that trained me how to read, how to write, how to think, my supervisors, Professor Luca de Bangbushi, Professor Tony Arowolo, Professor Michael Adetunji, Dr. Lubimi Fadino, the one that I shared a bed in my first ever international conference. I didn't have money to attend, and she said, Tony, we are going together. We, are share, we shared a bed together with her. Thank you, Ma. I know you are watching me now. God bless you. <laughs> I trust that you are all satisfied with this speech and that I haven't let you down in any way today. I appreciate you all for believing in me and for investing in me. And to my lecturers, okay. <laughs> and to my lecturers, colleagues, and friends at the Federal University of Agriculture, Abekuta, Nigeria, and elsewhere, I appreciate you all. 
I know you are also watching now. Thanks for your failing support. I especially acknowledge Professor Clement Adeofun, Professor and Mrs. Alec Beleye, Professor and Dr. Gio Olatunde, Dr. Latif Shotuyo, Professor Wasiwa Falabi, Dr. Jeanette Bangboshe, Dr. Babatunde Bada, Dr. Lushe Gonkutoke, Dr. Lawale Ajumo, Olatunde Olatunji. Can you please rise up, Dr. Latunji? Thanks for flying in also. Thank you for your support. Professor and Dr. Ataishe, Professor Abalanle Akele Dolu Ale, Mr. and Mrs. Olukayo De Ayodele, Mr. and Mrs. Ademola Rabiu, Professor Omemu, and the entire FUNAB alumni. Thank you for your support all these years. Now, <laughs> this piece will not be complete without acknowledging the contribution and support of the father of my children. Samuel Oludele Okpeolu, thanks for being a brother and a friend to me all those years and for the opportunity to love and be loved. To my beautiful jewels, Vitri, Victoria, and Glory. <laughs> Thank you for being my children, my friends, and my strong pillars of support. I'm grateful to God for the men and women that you are growing up to be. Thank you for being my angels on earth. I love you all, my beautiful rubies. Uh, permit me, Mr. Vice Chancellor, if I'm a bit emotional here now. I'm grateful to God for the blessing of a loving, kind, and strong grandfather, the one that supported and forced me to make my first public speech when I was 14 years old. A speech he wrote for me and insisted that I must deliver it on his own big occasion. The late Chief Brahim Babalola Ojetola, he raised me to have a voice of my own as a child. My special thanks to my dad also, Chief Tajuddin Olatunde Ojetola, the one in Toban, and my late mom, Ms. Simbiat Agbeke Ojetola, they both worked many shifts to earn enough to put me through school. I'm blessed to have you both as my parents. And to my siblings, Teslim, Kola, Mali, Kasis, Fatai, I know KG, you are all watching now also. Thanks for your support at all times. I couldn't have asked for better siblings. Thanks also to my aunts, uncles, and cousins, especially the Ojetolas, Akinyeles, Shobiyes, Kazims, Shitus, Ewulos, and Aligbedes. I love you all. To my spiritual father in Nigeria, Pastor John Oluleye, thank you for your love, leadership, patience, and support for the past 25 years. Special thanks to the Adeleyes, Olafimi Hons, Pastor Adejuma, and all members of King's Head Chapel. My sincere appreciation goes to the Christian Revival Church, CLC Cape Town, the senior pastors, Pastor Aiden and Sharon Jeffrey, who feed me and my family spiritually in Cape Town. Thanks, Ma, Miss Regina Antlapo, and Tom B for coming here also. I appreciate you, I appreciate your love and your support. <laughs> and thank you to all of the CLC team at large, and especially Pastor Rudolph, Ali, and Monica, thank you for your love and support for my family. Lastly, I acknowledge the contribution of the two religious organizations, the Ansaruddin Society of Nigeria, Imashai branch, that's my village, and the Anglican Communion, Awori Pada Diocese that enabled affordable quality primary and secondary education, respectively, for the child of a driver who was able to sacrifice a considerable portion of his earnings. The contribution of the two great African universities, FUNA and CPUT, to my career growth and accomplishments, I cannot emphasize those. Thank you, CPUT. Thank you, FUNA. As I leave this podium, today is not about me. 
This address is for the most vulnerable in our societies, the orphans in our communities, the girl child who dropped out of school due to teenage pregnancy, single mothers, and to every parent struggling to put a child through school. I am the child of a driver and a cleaner who was unemployed at some point and later strove to become a community health officer. The, the rest is history for my family, thanks to education. The shortest and the easiest way out of poverty for Africans and Africa is good and relevant education. And this is my story. May the Lord give all parents long life and health to reap the rewards of their labor. Amen. Amen. Eshen Kupo. and Kosi Kakulu. Bye, Danke. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you, Prof. Apiolu. Uh, you've left us really inspired. Thank you. Um, and I'm also reminded of one common saying that says, what you don't know can't hurt you, or something to that effect. <laughs> but I'm thinking, based from what you've told us, um, the air we breathe, the water we drink, the very earth that we walk on, can hurt us if we don't do the right thing. Um, I want to say thank you. We need scientists, researchers like yourself to guide us what to do. But also, personally, thank you for your own personal resilient and giving spirit. It's an example to all of us. Thank you. I'm tempted to. I'm tempted to say more, but I think this, that honor belongs to your responder, um, Prof. Limba, and it's my pleasure to read uh, a brief biography um, of Prof. Bekumusa uh, Jabulani Limba completed his BSc honors in chemistry at <coughs> Ongoy, University of Zululand, in 1993. In 1994, he obtained a USAID scholarship and graduated with an MSc in chemistry from Bucknell University in Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, USA. Um, and that was 1996. He then proceeded to Wayne State University in Detroit, 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 and graduated in 2001 with a PhD in chemistry. While at Wayne University, he did part of his project at Detroit Edison a coal-fired power plant uh, for the region. His work was on heavy metals in coal and coal fly ash. After graduating, um, Prof. Klimba joined the School of Chemistry at the University of um, Advets in 2002 as a lecturer, teaching first-year chemistry and some analytical chemistry's two modules. His, his other responsibilities were curriculum counseling, and supervision of integrated assessment projects for chemistry third year students. In October 2004, he was appointed as a lecturer here at CPUT, which was then called Pentec 2004, yes, Peninsula Technicon. Um, and he lectured all levels of analytical chemistry, including some sessions of chemical quality assurance. In April 2006, now at CPUT, he was promoted to senior lecturer and head of program, Bevel Campus of CPUT. In that position, he coordinated the analytical chemistry program at Bevel Campus and supervised research projects, undergraduate students and postgraduate students. In 2010, 
Prof. Limba became the full head of the Department of Chemistry. In 2013, until his retirement in 2016, he was the Assistant Dean, Faculty of Applied Sciences. During the same year, 2013, he was promoted to Associate Professor of Chemistry. Now, uh, some of his research and partnerships um, contributions include that he has published 25 publications in peer-reviewed journals, in, and the work involved remediation of trace organic compounds, um, phenols, PAHs, PA4s, PA4As, the list that we heard about, <laughs> as well as inorganic ones, um, arsenic, lead, cadmium, and zinc. And he uses remediation using biomass. He successfully supervised a number of masters and doctoral students and two postdocs. He collaborated with a number of institutions. Um, and in this regard, a research collaboration with the University of Ilorin in Nigeria involved two students from Ilorin who visited CPUT for three months in October 2011 and August 2014. Five papers were published from the experimental work of those students. Additionally, a student from Masan University in Kenya joined the Department of Chemistry in August 2011 for three months for experimental work on PCBs using LCMS. A research collaboration was established with MRC's Indigenous Knowledge Systems Division at Delft. Two MTEC students doing research at that IKS project were supervised by Dr. Weavers Prof. Mabusela, Dr. Mat uh, Matsabisa, and Prof. Klimba. He was an external examiner for master students at TUT and Watasulu University, and PhD students in India. He was a panel member of NRF uh, three projects from 2008 to 2014, and he also served as a member of the Regional Committee for the Chemical Industry Education Training Authority Kieta. Um, recently, uh, Prof. Klimba retired, and on retirement, he moved to KZN, where he's a board member of an independent school. It's my pleasure to welcome the respondent, Professor Klimba, to the stage. Mr. Vice-Chancellor, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, present and retired, <laughs> the deans, present and retired, <laughs> HODs of different departments, both academic and non-academic, officers of CPUT, staff, students, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed. <clears throat> Professor Opiolu, today I declare that it's your day. What an analogy. Tainted potpourri, referring to contaminated environment. In your <coughs> in your introductory video, you showed an extra skill that you have that that of being an orator. In all your talk. What we can summarize is, is that you, you are a pioneer, <clears throat> you are an advocate of research, teaching, and community engagement.
you are more than you are more than two decades of research, teaching, and community engagement. Your depth of, I'm sorry, it's mixed up. <laughs> <laughs> Your insight into global pollution and how it is impacting on our lives, it's both fascinating, but at the same time, it is disturbing. But the question that arises now is, how do we respond to it as individuals? How do most all institutions respond to it? How does the government our government responds to it. Fortunately, the National Development Plan also addresses environmental issues. And it is up to, uh, up to the institutions now to take the bait on, to explore, exploit that. <clears throat> However, it is also comforting to know that there are initiatives being put in place locally, regionally, and globally to slow down and even reverse the deteriorating state of our planet. In your talk, in terms of uh, biomass remediation, it's one of the ways how to reverse or completely remove toxic elements in the environment. Your presentation is quite inspiring. We are more than two decades of research, teaching and cultural and engagement, and your depth of understanding of environmental issues and your ability to present the subject in such an interesting way has made today one of the most memorable evenings. In your introductory talk, you said you wanted to register as a, as a chemist, and the door was locked. You opened the door next to it, that is environmental management. And once you got inside, the door to chemistry was open. <laughs> because in all your investigations, that is just nothing but applied chemistry. And you can't do applied chemistry without knowing the basics of chemistry. I won't say that you entered chemistry by back door. No, no. <laughs> We are a full chemist. <laughs> Last but not least, I would also like to congratulate you for climbing the ladder out to this position of being a, a full professor. You really deserve it, and we like to thank you very much for that, especially for the role that you have played in uplifting the, <clears throat> the African community and the role that you have also played of looking at the issues of women. In your introduction as <clears throat> a video, you elaborated a lot about the sufferings of a woman. It reminded me of a, of a song by, I've forgotten the, the, the person who sang it. But it says, even when you fall down, but wake up and hit the road. We hope God will help you in doing what you have done and what you are doing. You said you have been in this for 25, for, for more than 20 years. And we pray that God should give you a, more than 25 years to fight the battle, this battle you are facing. 
Ladies and gentlemen, this is a very serious issue of environmental pollution. Some videos, some, some pictures that you displayed there, most of them were from Nigeria. When I looked at them, I just saw South Africa. How polluted are our environment? especially the overpopulated areas. Keep on with research at CPUT. I know due to what you have done, some institution will like to take you. <laughs> Mr. Vice Chancellor, don't allow that. <laughs> Let's keep him here. Let's keep her here at CPUT. You have raised the flag of CPUT. And I hope after, you le after we left, Applied Sciences is still competing for position one in terms of research output. And you are one of the contributors in that area. And I'm also clear that in the, in the Faculty of Applied Sciences, I think more than 50% of women are pioneers of research. By this, on behalf of CPUT, we say thank you. And we congratulate you for the position you have just obtained. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. We've come to the end of this evening's inaugural address by Professor Opiolo. All that is left for me to do is to thank everyone that made this evening such a huge success. Let me start by thanking our Vice Chancellor, Professor Chris Ntlapu, for presiding over this evening's ceremony and for your warm welcome address. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor. Um, DVC Teaching and Learning, Acting Registrar, all the other members of the executive uh, management of CPUT, thank you for your presence here tonight and taking the time to come and join Professor Opiolo tonight. We really appreciate that. Um, attendance. Specifically, <laughs> specifically, Professor Kiyoko, thank you uh, for taking over as the acting dean of the faculty. Thank you for reading this impressive citation of Professor Opiolo and for the introduction of the responder here tonight. To all the staff and all the students of the Faculty of Applied Sciences for providing Professor Piola with that environment that she <laughs> explained and thank you for earlier this evening. All the deans, all the assistant deans, all the directors, all the research chairs, the professors, all the staff and all the students of CPUT for coming out in support tonight. We thank you for your presence here. Then I also want to acknowledge and thank our friends and our colleagues from other higher education institutions, both within the Western Cape nationally and internationally for your support, the industrial partners and all the funders that contributed towards the research. We thank you for all your support and your presence. We also want to thank everyone here tonight, physically present, and everyone that's online that has indicated um, by Professor Piolo earlier tonight. We thank you all for, for signing in to CPUT's online services. To the responder, Professor Timba, welcome back. 
Thank you for coming here tonight and for providing that response to Professor Piolo's inaugural address. We really appreciate it. To all Professor Piolo's special guests, physically present and online, specifically her three children that's here tonight, we want to thank Victoria, Victory, and Glory, not only for coming out and supporting your mother tonight, but for all the support that you've given her throughout her career that enabled her to stand on this podium tonight. Thank you very much to the three of you. Then you will agree with me that um, occasions like tonight is not possible without the hard work of some people that work behind the scenes that we don't always see and notice. So if you will allow me, I would like to start by thanking the Marketing and Communications Department, our Program Director, Ms. Cathy Kluter, the Director, Dr. Van Gensen, and all the members of the team that is working so diligently behind the scenes to make it possible for us to stream this live via different platforms. Thank you very much to all of you. To the staff in the Assessment and Graduation Center, our protection services, and all our technical support staff, we, you are here before the event starts, and you're here long after the event finishes. So we want to thank you all for your hard work and dedication to the evening. Then to everyone here tonight, thank you for joining us for this professorial address by Professor Opiolo. We thank you for your presence, and we hope that you will enjoy the, even, the rest of the evening with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marshall, for that lovely acknowledgement. And we have come to the end of the formal proceedings for the evening, but as Professor Sheldon has mentioned that, um, or didn't mention, <laughs> we, we have something outside for you to eat and just to sit and, and relax and enjoy uh, some nourishment to the body and soul with us tonight. Um, I see that uh, Prof. Opiolu, was, she was talking, she was getting thirsty, but I had a plastic bottle of water here. <laughs> so, but then eventually she saw the glass next to it, so she could throw it over in the glass, so thank you for that. Uh, the VC has mentioned that she is a distinguished professor, and... Um, with all the accolades and the, pro the credits and the achievements and the research projects, projects that she's currently busy with, she's also the most humble soul ever. And she's a good friend of, for many. And indeed, you are an African woman. And indeed, you are a product of grace and love. So let's give another round of applause for Christmas. Thank you. Um, you may remain standing. Uh, we are going to sing, sorry, we are going to do the uh, Gadiamos and the procession will leave the hall. So I would like for you all to please remain standing until the procession has left the hall. Drive safely and enjoy the evening further. Thank you so much, everybody.